Welcome to ABA On Call. Join myself, Rick Cabina. Uh, we can, we have so many studies that show if you have a behavior that's followed by a consequence, let's say it's positive, there's an increased likelihood that that's gonna happen in the future. And Doug Kostowitz. We behave differently because it was determined for us. It's not determined for all. For thought-provoking conversation, ideas and trends in the applied behavior analysis and healthcare technology industries. Hey everybody, would you like to get a CEU for this episode? Listen closely for the announcement of three secret words delivered throughout the episode. Take note of those words and we will tell you where to go to get your CEU when the show is over. Hello everyone and welcome to ABA On Call. As usual, I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Doug Kostowitz. And Dr. Doug, today is the day that we have an interesting transition. Not only are we going to be available via podcast, but people can watch us if they like to do so. Yes, they can. And so this is very exciting and uh, new to us. So uh, we're really stoked. Yeah, very stoked. And uh, in honor of our stokedness, <laughs> we had to come out with a topic that we thought would be very interesting and mm -hmm. something that many of you have probably addressed in graduate school. And of course, this is something that is part of the philosophy of behavior, which is free will. Mm -hmm. Do we have free will? But before we answer that question, right. let's get down to, well, what is free will? So Doug, tell us, what is free will? So I would say it is without anything else constraining you, you make decisions and, quote, do things because you, quote, want to do it or just can do it. So there's nothing holding you back from making whatever decision you want to make and behave in whatever way you want to behave. Yeah, uh, that is, that's it. And when the thing about free will is when people talk about it, it, a lot of concepts and just the idea by itself are uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. And you can never prove this with 100% certainty one way or another. But then again, you can never prove anything with 100% certainty or another. Uh, so uh, determinism is something that's very important to this idea of free will. And when we talk about determinism, that simply means that events are determined by previous or existing causes. Now, Determinism, Doug, is something that you know, when people first were talking about it, they were they weren't they, they talked about it in terms of behavior, but they were also talking about it like in terms of the universe. Right, right. And uh, that all things could be caused. And one of the issues that, uh, that that comes with this is sometimes people confuse what we mean by determinism right. with something called predeterminism, mm -hmm. which when we talk about predeterminism, we're just saying everything that's going to happen has happened. So why do anything? Because everything's predetermined. But right. that's, you're, you're going to yeah. do it. It's going to happen. Things are going to happen. There's no way to change it. You're fated to do these things. And that's yes. not determinism. No. And in fact, there's even another term called fatalism, mm -hmm. since you use that word. And mm -hmm. fatalism is just talking about that, uh, you know, we have this fate or destiny and uh, why should we try to do anything different if uh, these future events are inevitable? So there's a lot of terms in philosophy that when you have these deeper conversations, people are like, what, what do all these things mean? Mm -hmm. 
So determinism is, it's pretty simple. We're saying that thing, there are, are reasons why people do things. I mean, right. let's just talk about this in terms of behavior. Right. So there's, there are lawful, lawful things at work, right? It's you're given whatever's going on in the world around you, in your environment, certain behaviors are determined, but they're not fatal. Fatalized. And then it comes back to if they're determined, do we have that free will to not do the things that was determined to do? Right. And that we're, we're going to talk about other seconds uh, in other segments about the ramifications of this. But you know, what does it mean to have free will? Uh, if we have free will, that means that, you know, this gets, this gets into causality. Why are you saying and doing the things that you're saying and doing? Mm -hmm. Is it because they're determined or is it because you just choose to do them? Right. So I'm standing or I'm sitting here and I'm talking. Did I choose to do that? Or were, was there a string of events put in play that determined that I would be sitting here speaking with you? And as you mentioned earlier, it can't be proven. However, when you look at, some of you would look at the first uh, chapter, or first uh, attitudes of science, determinism is squarely in, and attitudes of science is also a hallmark of behavior analysis, but we'll be getting to that too a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad that you, you couch this in science because here's the bottom line. If you don't think there's anything that's determined, what the heck are we doing right. in psychology period? I mean, it, 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 how do you come up with these theories? Mm -hmm. Because in essence, everybody could just do whatever they want. Right. There's going to be no predictability, uh, although, you know, some people try to play both sides of this and they mm -hmm. say, well, it's really just probabilistic, mm -hmm. but it's hard to have a science of behavior if you don't believe that things are determined. Right. Why teach anyone to do anything if they can do whatever it is that they want to do at any time? Yeah. So the value of teaching someone and making it sort of worthwhile to them, we talk about uh, behavior analysis in that way of you know, gains for the individual. So why do that? If they can just go in whatever route they can and why use a certain teaching technique because it's more effective than another technique? There's reasons why we have that data because and why we control so many variables when we do our research because we're looking for based on determinism what can be accounted for and what can be put in sort of a functional relationship yeah and functional relations are really the key to science and what you're saying is these variables or this variable is functionally related to this variable. I mean, that's the basic of science and fundamental to that is that there's something that's determined, like these events are having this impact on this. And if you can determine that, then you can start understanding the world. And you know, outside of our realm of science, which is looking at behavior, this is true for everything. And every science is going to look at how do we have these relations and how does one thing, uh, how do these events determine what these other things, what are, these other things that are happening? So I want to, for those listening for their CEU, give you your first secret word. And your first secret word is agent. Ah, agent. Is that like secret agent? Or it is could it be. like agency, mm -hmm. which that's what we're talking about here. Uh, when you talk about determinism and you get into these debates over free will, you're really looking at agency. Who is the author of 
you, the events? Is it you where you were the author and you were the causal agent? So in other words, you just have this ability to do whatever you want for whatever reason, or is it what we understand through science that, well, there are these other events that happen, whether they be biological, whether they be behavioral, whether they be whatever, that those are playing a role in causality. So if they're not causal and we do maintain free will, or if it is causal and we don't maintain free will, when someone commits a crime, when someone doesn't do as well as they could on a mathematics assignment, when someone uses the wrong utensil when eating, when some, we, due to that agency, it's quick to be able to go back to the individual, rather it is to the events around that individual. Well, Doug, I think with that, let's move on to the second segment because you're just jumping us right into uh, these events that are incredibly important for mm -hmm. what, what we mean when we talk about free will. Well, Rick, this brings us into the second topic, which I was excited I started talking about in the first topic, and that is what do we lose? or gain if we say we have free will. So as a society, what we gain by maintaining free will is the responsibility of behavior can be put squarely on the person behaving. And I started to talk a little bit about that, but responsibility, accountability. So the person who can't do an academic assignment in the classroom, we don't initially come back to, they can't do it because they haven't been taught. We can say they didn't want to sit down. They didn't want to write the right answer. They didn't want to do the thing that they were supposed to do. When someone who's had perhaps displayed some very disturbing behavior, we may say, well, it's definitely on them. It can't be our responsibility because they had the choice of whether or not to do that. And that's the first thing as a society we gain, but there's a lot of losses there. Yeah, it is probably, even in our field, I've had this conversation, like, I, like you, I've taught graduate courses mm -hmm. and this will come up in graduate courses and even people who are learning behavior analysts or who claim they're behavior analysts, they start to get very uncomfortable when you push this all the way and say, well, what are the real issues? And, and what you just were talking about, I feel is very teacher centric in the sense that if we look at this through teaching, uh, yes, we can, we can assign credit and in, in different ways because it's the person who's causing these things. But even when we go out farther, which you started to, to talk about, we, we look at, uh, well, who is responsible for, like you can have a personal foible where maybe, uh, you know, you do something silly or stupid, but you can also do something that's very hurtful. And uh, if you're that person, how does that feel for you as an individual who has had something happen to them that has been hurtful? For example, let's say that, uh, you know, I go out to a, a sporting event and, and someone, you know, I'm wearing the opposing team's jersey. Someone comes up and just clocks me. And, uh, <laughs> oh, well, that person's behavior was determined. Everything's okay. Yeah, you, it's hard to say that, and but that is sort of the world works mostly on, hey, it really wasn't this product of the situation. It was that person wanted to do that. And it becomes infinitely easier if we can come up with another reason, perhaps mostly medically, why that behavior might have occurred or perhaps they had too much to drink or something. And then we can say, oh, it was because of these other factors. And it gets harder and harder 
when there's not something there to sort of excuse, then it's left to them. And what's missing is the things that you were talking about earlier. And that is, there's a whole bunch of other factors that are still out there that aren't readily apparent. Yeah. Our whole criminal justice system is set up that people have free will. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you were saying, if there are extenuating circumstances, uh, the person was under the influence of alcohol. We treat that very differently. We do. They look at DUIs. If mm -hmm. someone has a DUI and they hurt someone, they're going to get treated very differently than someone who was texting and hurt someone because right. the person who was texting took it upon their own selves to do something, they were personally responsible mm -hmm. and they hurt you. Whereas the other person, even though they were drinking beforehand, because they were under the influence of alcohol or whatever it is they were taking, they're less responsible. Or not even that. Let's say they just got into a, a horrible argument or had something horrible happen to them or had a medical condition where it wasn't apparent, like, uh, for example, a tumor in the brain pressing on decision making or something. It's easier to say, well, it was probably because of that, but we can't find that. We go, we become more and more harsh and we target that individual more. Yeah. Skinner had a, a lecture and we'll put this in our show notes and it's on YouTube. You can listen to it. And you can also read about it. It was in uh, the cumulative record. And he had this, he talked about on having a poem. And he jokingly says, this is, you know, I wrote this and I talked about this. And he draws this parallel on having a baby. And he points out that when you have a baby, that the mother is, you know, the locus of these events. You're not consciously making things happen when you have the baby. There's these biological processes that are happening. And when you have that baby, and again, this doesn't, you know, this isn't an attack against motherhood. This doesn't mean that mom shouldn't take prenatal vet, you know, medicine and they shouldn't go around smoking and doing all these irresponsible things. That's not, you know, what, what Skinner was saying. What he was saying is that if we look at having a baby, having poems, what's really responsible for those events. And we can look at them as being determined, being determined biologically, being determined behaviorally. Right. And we talk about it for, you know, we don't, this is, I, I, I'm going to go there, but we don't really say that animals have free will, right? They just do things. Yeah. And Skinner always said, Maybe I'm paraphrasing, but the rat was always right. The rat did what the environment said, right? It, it didn't decide to do things differently. And so much about behavior we talk about is we behave because that's what we did in response to everything. Not, yeah. not the yeah. – Right. Conscious decision, thoughts and feelings as a private events so that we can have another another podcast on that one. We're not going to go too far down that. But you 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 think about things. It, there are so many influencing factors that it doesn't have to stop at those medical concerns. It doesn't have to stop at other, you know. Uh, you know, the drug and alcohol example that you use, it can go to everything, your learning history, all these other aspects that we're going to be diving into a little bit more. But just the, the notion that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing under the conditions that we're that we have. Yeah. So the, the, there's two sides to this coin, and this is what you have to gain and lose. If you do not accept free will, if you say that we're determined, then you're going to look at people that commit crimes very differently, maybe with more compassion. And on the other side, when people do things that are great, you're going to lose the fact that like, oh, I'm this special, awesome individual. And, you know, on both sides of it, it offers a way of thinking about the world very differently than if we say that everybody is the author of their own events and everybody's choosing to do everything 
and they are 100% responsible for what happens. I'm going to stop you here and say secret word number two, and that is poem. Secret word Very two good. is poem in light of your and poems sharing. <laughs> yeah, that secret word is helpful because for all of you that would like to hear this, uh, I really encourage you to watch Skinner Talks for like an hour, and that's an easy read. And as a behavior analyst in being part of this science, I feel that when here's, – here's something that I like to t tell people about this. I am a thinking, feeling person. That's just part of who I am. If you do something to me that is not nice, I'm going to have emotions. I'm not going to like you doing those things to me. And I, I could be angry. I may do something. And, but just the fact that all of those things are determined, that the science can explain that, doesn't in any way cheapen the human experience. And that's where I feel a lot of people have a hard time with this free will notion. Just because I can accept that, you know, here I am, uh, I have a PhD, and there are events that led me to this. There are events that, uh, and again, it's not fated, it's not predetermined. Uh, there very well could have been uh, events that led me to be doing something completely different. But that that doesn't discount the science. Just because we understand science and we understand the physics of something, it's the same thing with behavior analysis. Let's understand it and accept it, but that doesn't in any way change us being humans. Okay, Rick, let's go into the third part. And that is, what does behavior analysis have to say about this topic? And when you think about the science of behavior, you think about one of its prime drivers, and that is behavior is selected by its consequences. Which you, and when you talk about behavior, it's movement through space and time. So you can't take behavior out of the environment and behavior is increased or decreased in its likelihood by what happens after and under what certain conditions. So you can't take behavior out of the environment and environment dictates that behavior. So as you can see, it does not hold to a free will model. Yeah, we have, let's just, let's just talk about consequences. And I would like to point out to everyone that behavior analysis has lots of information about consequences, but people in our field are not saying that's not the only thing that has to deal with behavior. We realize that we are biological entities and things like genetics, uh, uh, you know, our current states, there's all of these physical vari uh, biological variables that also play into it. But you know, we're going to, we'll restrict our conversation uh, to consequences and, and, and just what, what does that mean? Uh, we can, we have so many studies that show if you have a behavior that's followed by a consequence, let's say it's positive, there's an increased likelihood that that's going to happen in the future. And at some point, this go, this harkens back to what you and I were talking about earlier when you look at science and you pursue functional relations, you can never prove something with 100% certainty. But you know what? We have so much information about gravity that it's pretty probabilistic. And if someone says, hey, if you jump off this building, you're likely going to fall, right. you can choose not to believe that. But you know what? The evidence says something right. a little bit different. Oh, evidence. Evidence is the third secret word. Evidence. Oh, yes. Very good. And that evidence in terms of consequences, in terms of the three term contingency that was we talked about for so long, it has had we had just so much evidence about it that you can't discount no. that as being this factor that determines the future likelihood of. Behavior. So what I see is happening is some of the other aspects of a science of behavior that come into play that can kind of set the stage for something that looks, you know, it makes 
free will sort of come to fruition, their thinking about that. And that is, we already talked about the environment dictating behavior. Well, we all have individual learning histories. So we have interacted with similar environments, the same environment, different environments, and we have seen different behaviors appear in our repertoire. We've seen behaviors strengthened. We've seen uh, behaviors that have diminished under the same conditions. So talking about Rick and I, we could be presented with similar environmental influences and do something totally different. But it wasn't that we individually, quote, decided to do that, given our unique learning histories and how we have interacted with the different consequences under certain conditions, what's going on in my life the, the, compared to what's going on in Rick's life. We behave differently because it was determined for us. It's not determined for all. So environment doesn't just determine us all to do one thing. Behavior is determined but all behavior is individual given your learning history. And I think that that helps understand a little bit more of why under certain conditions, and I'll use a teaching example, even though Rick will say, don't use a teaching example. It, you, you, well, I wouldn't I know, say I'm that. I'm just joking. So the, the, you've got a teacher who's presenting something. 30 kids may be responding very well because they have something similar in learning history and one may not. And Mm -hmm. That child is doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, given their uni unique learning history. Yeah. The, the thing about free will and determinism and not having free will is that, as you're pointing out, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to respond the same way. And even if you have a particular way that you've always responded, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to always respond that way in the future. Uh, when I leave my house, I have no control. So where there's some indeterminism in the system, like I don't know what's going to happen when I walk out of my house. Uh, is someone walking by? Is someone driving by and, you know, they're texting and not paying attention? Like I have no control over these events. And because we live in a world where chaotic things can happen, does in no way say or disprove the fact that my behavior is determined. I, I always think so people say, well, since you told me I'm going to do that, I'm not going to do that. Oh, my God. And I say, same. Thought. And I say, exactly. It was determined. If I wouldn't have said anything, you probably would have done it or you wouldn't have. It doesn't matter what I would do. I'm part of the environment. You may have a learning history and you may have received a ton of reinforcers in response to making other people unhappy. And I may say, I don't want you to do that. It's gonna make me unhappy. Well, then I'm gonna do it because that's, you're basically setting the stage for, hey, you're gonna be unhappy and that provides me reinforcement. That's not free or you may not. Yeah. It's still determined yeah. and that's okay. And understanding that actually gives us a chance to arrange environmental conditions. So as teachers, that's, that knowledge is imperative because then that forces us to arrange the environment differently, individualized education plans, and arrange it differently for individuals so that that person can display behaviors that they need. Yeah. There's this meme that's been going around social media and I'll see some behavior analysts post this And the meme says it, it shows a picture of a plant or a flower. And they'll say, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. And, uh, that meme is really getting at this whole idea of what we're talking about. If, and, and on the other hand, that's, that's very liberating mm -hmm. rather than say, you know, this kid's not learning because they're stupid. This kid's not learning because they're lazy. Right. What is the going on in the environment? You can never change traits. And if the person is this causal entity that's making everything happen, you're going to have a heck of a time. Uh, you know, bringing evidence-based procedures or doing things to help that person. But with a behavioral view and understanding that, yes, we can look 
for influences in the environment and help that it's it's very liberating and that's another reason why i feel we shouldn't have a hard time with this notion of free will and determination. Yeah, and, and I want to say one other thing. I know we don't want to go too deep into it, but prior to events are behavior. And you can yeah. have the three, you know, as a snapshot, the three-term content. You can have that occurring as you're imagining doing something, right? And you get that thought can get a consequence of another thought. Everything can occur at that and, but others don't see that. So you may not see that someone is still, the environment is there in dictating that behavior. So it's, it's okay. You know, it, it is, it's liberating, it's freeing rather than free. Really? Did I go that way? No, man. Sorry. It's okay. We'll forget All right. Well, that's time. good to know. Yeah. Uh, the whole notion of you know free will versus determinism is one that as we said earlier you can never prove or disprove it but you certainly can bring evidence to bear and say what's most likely the mm -hmm. truth and you and i have focused a lot on the behavioral evidence but even biologically speaking you know there are studies done that uh, like on oxytocin, which is considered like the love or cuddled, uh, uh, cuddle hormone, where uh, they've done studies and they've seen if, if mothers, when they have low instances of this versus mothers that have high amounts of it, uh, the way they talk to their kids, the way they cuddle with their kids, you know, that, that biological evidence shows is the mom really responsible if we have this evidence? And it's not just in humans. There's all of this evidence in animals that shows the same thing. So we've talked a lot about the consequences and, and what behavior analysis brings to the table, but there's also all this biological evidence. So as far as I'm concerned, if someone asks me, you know, do we have free will or don't we have free will? Are behaviors determined? I'm very comfortable saying that, well, it looks like the evidence says that behaviors are determined. Well, Doug, that was an exhilarating topic as usual. And it is great that now people can actually have the luxury, if they like, of seeing us making our uh, gesticulations, our funny faces, our shaking our fists in anger, and all the other things that don't come through when we're just podcasting. So on behalf of Doug, let me thank you all for joining us on the ABA On Call podcast. Thanks for watching this episode of ABA On Call. To get your CEU, follow the link and instructions below the video. You can enjoy the program again there, or you can go straight to the attendance verification quiz. Just enter the secret words and pay the CEU fee to generate your certificate.